the next session, which is marine spatial planning and vessel activity detection. And uh, our first speaker is Taida. Taida Bino. I'm going to introduce you. Taida works as an ocean biologist in the Oceans and Coastal Management Division at Fisheries and Ocean Canada. Based in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, his work involves contributing to the preservation and comprehension of marine ecosystems. I'll make a correction. I'm actually a spatial analyst. I just fell oh. under Did I? biologist. Right. I did pay thing for some reason. Thank you for correcting. Oh, just no worries. Why did we get the wrong idea? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes cuts off the presentation. No, no, it's not. Here's the sample word. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Tyler Vino, and as I mentioned, I work with Marine Spatial Planning right here in uh, Dartmouth. And uh, this is just a quick overview of the kind of work that I do with Marine Spatial Planning and that uses AIS data. Uh, so these are some of the data sets that I produce. Uh, we have the vessel density mapping, uh, fisheries uh, density mapping. Uh, I also use AIS data for uh, ballast water mapping and anchor statistics. And all this information is used for marine spatial planning to help with uh, <clears throat> protection of our uh, waterways as well as uh, helping with planning out to uh, development areas. So this is just a quick sort of Image of uh, the, the data that we use, we get it from uh, Transport Canada, and what they do is they merge the terrestrial data and the satellite data. Uh, the reason why that's done is because the terrestrial data, as you can see, the blue dots is uh, much denser temporally, uh, as opposed to the you know, satellite data, which is the yellow stuff. Um, however, the, the blue dots don't actually extend far into the ocean, so we need that satellite data to get the broader picture, uh, and that's why it's merged together. <clears throat> and this is the basic process of why, or sorry, of how it's merged. Uh, the first phase of the, uh, the script actually goes through and uh, <clears throat> filters out anything that's not vessel related in AIS data. And then it also filters things out that is erroneous, uh, values that don't match up to the, the ranges that they're supposed to be, or anything that's like just a crazy number uh, in null values. Uh, to correct some of the uh, reported data that's in the static <coughs> AIS data, we actually, or sorry, Transport Can actually goes <coughs> to. Uh, those databases, uh, sort of marine databases, to uh, <clears throat> join that information to the ships so that we can get a clearer picture of uh, what vessels are doing what and what their uh, classifications are. And then uh, those uh, track lines are built by, make, by using those uh, AIS points and turning them into vertices or lines. Um, and that's basically step one of uh, going through the process. Step two is when I come in and I actually go and uh, categorize all those uh, uh, tracks into uh, their categories as well as their, their time categories. And then uh, I join all that information to a grid and calculate the statistics to get a density map, which generally looks like this. Uh, this is a, a map of our 2019 data, and this is for all act vessel activity. And uh, that same process is also applied to our VMS data to get a similar sort of uh, map that shows uh, fishing activity for maritimes. 
Um, the other project that we are working on is uh, using AIS data to track our ballast water activity within the Maritimes. Uh, the, uh, the script that uh, we currently run was first, it uh, goes into the ballast water exchange records and it takes the vessel information, the date and time, and the location that that happened, and it searches uh, an AIS database that we have. Uh, we get it also from Transport Canada, it's the same data that was used for uh, the previous density map. Uh, I have it all as a uh, parquet files and the script basically searches it and it looks for all the AIS points belonging to that vessel for that date and time and it uh, uses those to create uh, tracks or sort of the track for that time frame and then it uses the location to actually clip it out to give us an idea as to where the vessel was when it did its ballast water exchange and then I join all that data back to that ballast water record to get a map that looks something like this. This one here is the uh, the volume that was actually exchanged, and I basically put that into a grid so you can see what uh, parts of the ocean are actually getting the most amount of uh, ballast water dumped into it or taken up from it. Uh, and this one here is uh, the same sort of thing, except for it's uh, all the ballast water tracks that uh, for 2020. Um, categorized by the uh, reported uh, treatment that was done, whether that was MP2 or a dilution, flow through, et cetera. <clears throat> and uh, that information is used uh, to sort of help understand what kind of impacts ballast water may be having in some of our marine protected areas. Uh, and one of the other data sets we create is the uh, anchors data set, uh, or anchors time, uh, sorry, anchors data sets. Uh, Coast, the uh, Canadian Coast Guard sends us information as to when vessels have arrived and left certain anchorages, and that's been derived from AIS data. Uh, what we do is we uh, an idea as to how long vessels have actually been spending in these anchorages to get an idea how long, how much usage these anchorages are seeing, and it's uh, mapped out in uh, vessel hours, so the longer. An anchorage is used by a number of vessels, the, the higher the value. And this has been important with our uh, offshore wind program to help us, to, to help prevent us from uh, actually impeding on some of these anchorages for safety issues. And this is just uh, a sample of the data that was been put together uh, showing some of the anchorages in and around Nova Scotia and how much use they are, they get. Uh, and this is uh, the Shebecto Bay area, which is uh, an anchorage that's used quite often and is uh, close to where we're doing some of our uh, offshore wind analysis. Um, so for us, the, uh, the idea of a, an AIS pipe, pipeline is uh, something that we're very interested in. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you can of course the next. Sorry? Make it come closer. Oh, well, we would uh, be very interested in the next pipeline, and it would very much help us with our work, as well as uh, being able to embed some of that data directly into uh, tools and apps that we could use uh, for our scientists to help with research projects. Mm -hmm. so, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next on the program is Cassandra Konesny, and she's going to join us online. Cassandra, are you there? <laughs> Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you okay. Is it possible that you can share your screen or do you want us to share the presentation? Uh, yeah, I can share it. That might be easier. Give me a second. Cassandra is a marine ecologist and geographic information system analyst at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, supporting marine spatial planning through the development of biological, environmental and marine activity special data products. Cassandra holds a Master's of Science in Zoology from the University of British Columbia and an advanced diploma from the GIS Application Specialist Program at Fleming College. Please go ahead. Okay, you can see my screen okay, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, similar to Todd's presentation, incorporating AIS into our marine spatial planning program. Okay, so I wanted to start out briefly just touching upon what is marine spatial planning. Uh, but again, as Tyler said, it's essentially looking at these different uses for ocean space 
Um, and often we look at them through development of spatial data products, such as maps, so we can better understand different ecological, economic, cultural, and social objectives. So the role of our MSP team, uh, we are nested within uh, science, within DFO. And so our main purpose is to develop spatial data layers to inform the marine spatial planning process. And I'm not going to go into all these uh, different layers we've developed, but I've just listed some examples, um, as well as making them available uh, on open data, which Claudio touched upon earlier. And then as well, we provide GIS support to colleagues as needed. So that could be anything from uh, working on projects, uh, contributing to publications, or also just simply creating maps. So I'm going to touch on three main AIS data use cases uh, within our team uh, that we've encountered. So the first one is actually what kind of got us involved in uh, starting to use these data and uh, engaging with some of you folks. And I just want to uh, make sure I give great thanks to uh, Claudio and the Meridian team, specifically uh, Matt for helping uh, share data with us that has been used in this project. And also, I have used the AIS, uh, DB, uh Python package, and it's fantastic. Um, but I won't talk about that too much. Um, so this was a project uh, where the goal was to essentially link uh, a large scale soundscape for the region to un better understand potential interactions between uh, ocean sound and uh, fisheries within the region. And uh, this was a project led by Dr. Corey Morris, a uh, scientist within our region. But uh, I want to emphasize the collaborative nature of this project. So. Um, this involved different uh, institutions, industry, uh, a lot of work by JASCO, and I think I saw Bruce on the participants list there. So shout out to Bruce and uh, as well other government uh, partners. And so uh, again, the goal was the first part involved producing a soundscape for the region. And so to do that, we really had to uh, better understand uh, the sound produced by all these different sources uh, of noise within the ocean uh, scape. And so to do that, we had to uh, get AIS data to then provide uh, to JASCO for the modeling. And so, um, yeah, that's where this became an important part of the project. And so, again, without getting into too many details here, I just want to highlight these are some of the different uh, sound sources that uh, JASCO considered in their modeling um, across time for the area. You can see the different ranges, but those details don't really matter here. Um, and then just to show you then basically uh, what they were able to do is uh, in the different project uh, deliverables, what we can do is then look at these different uh, sources of noise uh, and understand uh, how those values change through time. So this was modeled at a daily scale and then also through the study space. And so that allows us to go from just, you know, overlapping uh, data layers that are uh, aggregated. And um, looking at things at more of a continuous temporal scale, but also continuous spatial scale uh, to use in the analysis. And then the second use case we have for these data are to go into cumulative impact mapping and commercial use density layers. So the cumulative impact mapping uh, is a project that multiple regions within DFO have taken on. Uh, so we're largely following on work that's been done by other regions, but uh, essentially, the uh, process here is to take different marine activities um, to act as your drivers or stressors within the system and look at their impacts on either habitats, species, or other value components, which might have different vulnerabilities. So, of course, AIS data would fit in here as um, an activity uh, and be used in that analysis in that way. And then, uh, similarly, uh, nationally, there's uh, a working group to develop uh, commercial use density layers. And so um, that is 
more similar to looking at kind of just the first component of the cumulative impacts mapping, where it's just uh, looking at where these different uh, commercial uses occur uh, within the ocean nationally. And then the third use case I'll touch upon is uh, potential uses of AIS data in the IMRP program, which is the Integrated Marine Response Planning Program. So the Newfoundland IMRP group is kind of just getting started here, and uh, these are some ideas they contributed uh, where AIS data might be useful. So a lot of it is uh, around understanding potential high-risk areas for environmental incidents, uh, and also to aid in the development of uh, potential response scenarios. So these are some metrics they imagined might be useful is looking at uh, vessel transits across space, um, and these could be at different temporal scales. So getting uh, a broad idea of maybe uh, annual transits, but then also looking at finer temporal scales, and then also looking just at vessel traffic um, by ports. So I'll just conclude by going over key challenges and takeaways from our experience in working with these data. Um, so some of the challenges, uh, as Claudio already mentioned, was is obtaining the raw data. So you have to go to multiple sources, multiple agreements in place, and just the volume of data. Um, so sometimes that involves shipping hard drives, um, which can just take a while. Uh, also, Data processing, although, again, I want to recognize just the efforts from the ASDB package have made that a lot easier and very painless. Um, also, just detecting and filling in gaps in the data where possible. So um, I know there's a few gaps that, for example, JASCO identified in the AIS data that we're going to be looking to fill. And then I know um, there's some earlier um, terrestrial AIS data where we're looking to fill gaps. And then uh, the last challenge that I've noticed, and again, many others have already spoken to it, but just the differences in existing data products across regions, which if you're using it within the region might be less of a problem. But for example, if we get requests nationally where um, they're asking for vessel traffic within the past five years and could every region provide that data. Um, it's important that it's analyzed in the same way or processed in the same way so that uh, metrics are actually comparable between regions. And that's all I have. Very Thank excited you. about this work. <laughs> Thank you so much. And your, your suggestions in the end. Yeah, and, and uh, ideas we can discuss later. Um, I'm gonna awesome. I'll now introduce Lee Kraft, who's going to take over for the last talk in this session. Lee is uh, also at Fisheries and Ocean Canada. He's a policy advisor whose work focuses on experimentation and deployment of AI models and the development of AI guidance materials. One of such use cases on which he's worked has examined the application of AI to AIS data in order to automate the detection of vessel fishing activities and improve the accuracy of ocean monitoring and management. Please, yeah, you can see us. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so I'll assume everything's working properly with the screen share. Let me know if there's issues seeing it. Um, so yeah, part of my work uh, involves doing experimentation with AI to sort of explore ways in which we can leverage AI models to provide innovation and facilitate workflows within DFO. Uh, and one of these uh, projects that we've worked on has uh, been in the capacity of developing a model that can examine vessel movement behavior via AIS data and then predict whether the vessel is engaged in fishing activity or not. Uh, so the idea here is to enable more effective monitoring of vessel activities. Uh, although AIS transmissions do have a navigation status field, which can be used to indicate fishing activity, that field might not always be correctly set. This could be due to omission. It could be due to accidental or perhaps even intentional entry of incorrect information. So we want to be able to detect fishing activity without relying on that field so that we have a more consistent and reliable source of fishing status information. And that can then in turn be used for other types of analysis using the information. Uh, so we might use that for things like detecting hotspots of fishing activity or detecting illegal fishing activities using the AIS data. So 
what we're doing is we're taking AIS transmissions, we're processing them into appropriate inputs for an AI model, and then that AI model can classify each of the AIS transmissions with a binary label to indicate whether a vessel appears to be fishing or not at that current time. Now we've used uh, a model called an explainable boosting machine to do this, and you can see in the slide in this uh, table there are some results from experiments that we've run. Uh, so this shows performance across different fishing gear types. We've been able to get very good performance from the model, but I'm not going to go into further details here about the model or the experiments uh, because I want to focus the talk on how we're making use of the AIS data. So the basic idea uh, behind uh, kind of the theory here is the vessel movement behavior can reveal fishing activity um, by looking for essentially vessels that are moving slowly and are making constant changes to their course. That's a fairly good indicator of fishing activity. And Gabriel kind of spoke a little bit to this in his presentation earlier. Um, so this type of information, we can get this from the AIS transmissions. The most pertinent fields that we want to look at are the vessel identifier so that we can distinguish between different vessels, the timestamp so that we can understand how vessel behavior is changing over time, and then the speed and course information so that we can understand the actual movement behavior of the vessel. Now, because we need to understand the behavior over time, what we do is we calculate statistics for vessel speed and course over different sized windows of time. And the statistics that we're using here are average speed, standard deviation of speed, and standard deviation of vessel course. These were shown by Global Fishing Watch to be useful features uh, for detection of fishing activity. You can kind of see that from the uh, the 3D plot on the slide, which is over those three dimensions. So the red data points there are showing fishing activity. So you can see how they're sort of clustered within that space. Uh, we use these statistics calculated over various windows of time, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, and so on. Uh, so those become inputs to the AI model that we're using. Now, in order to process the AIS data to get it ready for the AI model, that's a fairly big part of the work. Uh, so for basic data cleaning, we're first of all removing transmissions that might have any missing information that's necessary for the model. We also check for any large gaps in the vessel tracks, uh, since that impacts our ability to calculate the statistics if we're missing big chunks of time. Then we can take the clean AIS data, we split it into different trips that are made by vessels, and we're considering any kind of a stop at a port to be a division between trips. So to do that, we need auxiliary information on port locations. Uh, we basically want to make sure that the windows that we are using to calculate statistics don't span over different trips made by a vessel that occur in quick succession. Vessels also sometimes will sit idle at a port and continue to send transmissions, so we want to make sure to cut out any of those idle periods from the data that we're working with as well. And then finally, we can get to the feature engineering, so we can calculate our speed and course statistics. We also derive some other features for the model, so we're looking at things like bathymetry and distance to the uh, nearest shoreline from the vessel's current location. So that requires referencing the latitude and longitude information from AIS transmissions and then taking that against auxiliary sources of data. So to conclude, the um, AIS data can be a very valuable resource for drawing interesting insights, uh, both in terms of what we're looking at and of course all the other presentations today, uh, but to use it to do this, there is a lot of processing required that's definitely not insignificant. Uh, it does require having a good understanding of the data, having the appropriate skills to process it and the appropriate tools to do that. So I think there really is value in building tools uh, that can help people by reducing and simplifying the effort that's needed uh, with kind of certain types of common processing tasks. So really interested to see what types of things come out of uh, the project that's being proposed here. Uh, so with that, I'll wrap it up. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. And now we can have questions for all the speakers. <clears throat> so maybe Tyler, if you want to come to the front one more time, and the other two, <laughs> and then online, please leave your, yeah, please leave your um, camera on. Cassandra and Lee. So we can... Perfect. Questions? When your, your bow spotters change along the tracks, do you have time specific periods along the tracks where there are changes on balance? And do you have volume? 
guess. So the information that's in the ballast water record is an is an MSI number, uh, and there is a uh, start and location where they start at the exchange and the end of the location and a, and a date that it happened. So what uh, the script does is it basically grabs all the AIS points for that MSI that's from within five days, and then it draws the line, and then it clips it to the area that they uh, said that they were active in. And I get that from taking the start and locations and buffering them out, and then doing a negative of that buffer, so it's kind of like a shape like this, and the line that's in between generally stays within that, like that they don't kind of go in big loops, and they kind of go mostly straight. Um, there is some wobble, but anyway, yeah, so that, that track is what I say was the exchange, and then I figure out from there how much water they would have exchanged per kilometer of the route and then <clears throat> that to the, the grid cells. And then and I'm just, I have ulterior motives, but have you ever converted those into like a contour plot of um, looking for concentrated areas where ballast water would be exchanged? Um, so in that southwest Nova Scotia Delta main area, instead of presenting it as tracks, can you present it more spatially as in contouring volume of water, sort of aggregating all those tracks and exchanges? Yeah, the, the first data set that I showed in that was actually a, a grid, and it was uh, an accumulation of how much ballast water has been dumped in each one of those grid cells. So the darker the color, the, the more water that's actually gone there. Um, that was my attempt to kind of do that, but I haven't actually used the uh, try to contour method uh, to do that. Yeah, okay. I'll follow up with you. Oh, okay. Mark? A uh, question for Lee about the phishing detection using AI methods. Um, do you have a feel for how well those methods have been developed in more southerly waters and potentially work up in the Arctic or marginal ice zones where maybe more fishing activity may occur in the future where you ship? kinematic behavior may be more influenced by the environment, like the ice condition, it may operate a bit more erratically, which may trigger your fishing detection rules. Yeah, so um, in terms of the scope that we were exploring with this, we didn't do any comparisons between different geographic regions, so I can't speak from our own work at the differences there, but I do know that um, Global Fishing Watch, which had done uh, similar research on this, is working with global data sets. So they have um, AIS and I believe also VMS data from all over the world. Um, and I'm not sure if in their study they actually went into any detail about different geographic regions either, but at least there is the possibility to test that because um, they have publicly shared some of their uh, AIS data, which is annotated with phishing activity. So I imagine that it would be at least possible to kind of take that and break it up into different regions and then measure performance. So can't give you any details, but it should be feasible to study it at least. Sure. Thank you. Lee, I have another question on top of that. Uh, do you, uh, your label data, is that based on real fishing data, kind of from VMS, or you label your data based on the geometry of the tracks? So this data that we used for training purposes was coming from Global Fishing Watch. And what they had done is they took all the data and they had um, kind of expert analysts who are familiar with looking at vessel tracks and identifying from it what fishing activity looks like. So they were using kind of basically, yeah, the, the geometric properties of what it looks like, but it was not done in an automatic sense. It did have uh, human annotation. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, Lee, this is Claudia. Just a quick question about your analysis of the tracks. Do you analyze the whole tracks once you clean them, or do you focus on specific parts of the track for the fishing to characterize the fishing? Yeah, so we do analyze the whole tracks. Basically, we're using these windows of time that are calculating these statistics, but each of them are based on a particular transmission. So if we want to know at one transmission is the vessel fishing or not, we would be looking at kind of the past 12 hours worth of transmissions, calculating those stats and then making the prediction. And then we move on to the next AIS transmission in the track and do the same thing. So at each transmission along the track, we can provide that prediction. Thank you.